joined by um, the man, the legend, Steve D'Angelo. Steve, can you hear us? Loud and clear. Happy All to be right. with you. Um, how, where are you? How things in uh, America? I am uh, talking to you from my home studio, high in the hills of Oakland, California. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, Steve, I, I can't say, you know, what a, an honor it is for us to have you. Um, yeah, huge fan of your work. And, and um, I guess um, I, was, I, I first, I think, came across your work, your book, The Cannabis Manifesto. Um, yeah, really, for me, like, I guess, um, was the first time I heard a lot of things, I guess, I felt put you know, put into words or something, you know, um, so eloquently, but, but yeah, I guess I really wanted to know what was your first experience? How did you get into, into cannabis and, and activism? Well, it, it really grew out of my very first experience with the plant, which came as a young teenager. I think it was 13 years old after school at a friend's house, uh, one day smoked a joint, uh, felt nothing initially and started walking home. And my way home took me through a park and I'm a 13 year old boy. I, you know, I go through this park every day. It's a shortcut. It's a way to get from one place to another. It's a thoroughfare. I don't really notice much what's going on in the park usually, but this day I start walking down this path and I start noticing all these things I never noticed before, like the sun coming through the leaves of the trees uh, and filtering down on the path. The, uh, the dead leaves that are, are crunching underneath my feet, the uh, same sun on the back of my neck, moisture uh, from my sweat coming up on the back of my neck and hearing in the background the gurgling of a creek. And, and there came a moment where all of these things just came together for me and I felt myself in this very deep and profound way to be a part of the web of life, connected to that creek, connected to that sunlight, connected to those leaves and you know being 13 coming from a very secular family i uh, it took me some some time to recognize what that experience was which was really my first genuine spiritual experience um but i knew immediately coming out of that park that it was a very special experience that uh, this plant was going to remain a part of my life and of course, by then I understood that it was illegal. And, uh, and so I think by the time I got home, I decided that I was going to be working to make the plant legal. And, and yeah, it's kind of been in your life ever since, right? Um, um, the Constantly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, cannabis, um, has been a part of my life since I was 13 years old. I spent, um, probably about 15 years as a, as a street activist, um, doing demonstrations, smoke-ins, teach-ins, uh, traveling all over the country. Uh, and then I started developing a niche for cannabis businesses that were legal that allowed me to make a living and tell the truth about cannabis at the same time. And the first of those was an industrial hemp company that I started in the late 1980s. Uh, I, about a decade later, came out to California and I've uh, been responsible for launching some of the most important early companies in California, the first gold standard dispensary, Harborside, the first testing lab for cannabis, Steep Hill, and the first investment company for cannabis, the, the RQ Group. So that led Willie Brown, the mayor of San Francisco, former mayor of San Francisco, we wish he was still mayor today, um, to call me the father of the legal cannabis industry. It's quite a, quite a, an accurate. So you had quite the transformative experience uh, at the age of thirteen, and then kind of jumped headfirst into activism, um, entrepreneurship. Has there, has there been any standout moments as uh, as as an activist uh, growing up? Well, I, you know, I was growing up in Washington, D.C., and I uh, came from a civil rights family. Uh, at five years old, I went to Martin Luther King's March on La Washington with my mother, and we handed out sandwiches that we had made the night before to hungry marchers. So, uh, and then um, by 1969, 1970, the whole town of Washington was basically taken over by protesters protesting the Vietnam War. And Every weekend, there was some kind of demonstration, and most of those weekends and many of my school days, uh, I would take off and go down there and be a part of that. So 
that was sort of the the milieu that I grew up in. I always associated activism as being a, a positive civic act. I was raised to believe that if I see somebody suffering from anything, but especially from injustice, and I have an ability to do something about it, then I also have a duty to to act. So the the activism just came uh, very naturally to me, almost without thinking about it. Yeah, and it's continuing oh, to nice stay. Uh, so, um, well, yeah, I was going to just ask about the the last prisoner project, Steve. Um, it's something that I've I've been following. Um, yeah, from from this side of the pond, but it seems really um, transformative, right? There's there's people incarcerated in prison, um, often patients or people, you know, caregivers, um, often, um, and your you and the last prisoner project you're trying to get these convictions quashed is that right yeah exactly i mean it 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 would seem sensible right that when society legalizes cannabis and says look it, it shouldn't be illegal um and it's not illegal then the people who are being punished for the thing that's not illegal anymore would be released you'd think that that would happen sadly tragically it does not happen uh in every piece of legalization legislation that has been passed thus far, uh, there are no pr provisions to release people who are in, in prison on cannabis charges. In the United States, of course, this is a very racially tinged issue, more than tinged, uh, because the overwhelming majority of prisoners <clears throat> in, in on, on cannabis charges, like in the federal system, 87% of people serving time on cannabis charges are people of color. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so there's a real racial dimension to it. And, um, there's something like 40,000 people in the United States still serving time. So it was, it was a natural step for me. Once we legalized cannabis in California in 2018, then to start thinking about getting prisoners out and we launched the organization, excuse me, <clears throat> we all launched the organization about uh, a year ago. Um, a little bit over a year ago, and it's just um, received a lot of support from the legal cannabis industry. We've uh, participated in releasing several prisoners thus far. Um, we've uh, helped to release several hundred other prisoners for emo emergency COVID uh, issues. But what's becoming clearer and clearer is, is that LPP really needs to be a global organization. Um, we are committed to uh, doing this job and not stopping and not resting until the last cannabis prisoner comes home, no matter where they are in the world. And I just wanna highlight one case for you now that I don't know if you've already talked about it, but um, Spain's one of Spain's absolute leading uh, activists, a real hero, hero uh, to our movement, Albert Tio, on Wednesday entered prison for a five year term for running a cannabis association in Barcelona. He's been fighting this case for eight years. He exhausted all of his legal appeals and so right now he is sitting in prison. He has three children. And, uh, and I think that, that it's just, we, we cannot allow things like that to happen. If we allow them to lock Albert up, then no other cannabis association in Europe is going to be safe. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so true. Wow. Um, go on, Francis. That's so that sounds like an incredible project um we've been following some of the stories on on instagram and seeing some of that progress is is really good to see it's it's horrific that things like that are still happening especially as um you know the boys there are in wales but i i live in canada now and um we have legal access but there's you know people still sitting in prison um how can how can we all get involved? I'm sure we've got a lot of people on the chat um, that that would love to, you know, be involved, show some support to this. Uh, what's what's the best way, Steve? Uh, go to lastprisonerproject.org and uh, give us a, your email address. Drop us a line, um, and uh, there's a million different ways to participate. One of the very simple things that anybody can do is just to help us raise awareness. Uh, we're very, very active on social media, and every like, every repost, every retweet uh, helps us get word out. Um, donations are are always helpful. Volunteer work, um, you know, we we do a lot of uh, outstanding media work. We just won a Clio Award, which is a very prestigious global advertising award. 
for some of the messaging that we've been doing. And all of that was created by people who volunteered to help out the Last Prisoner Project. So um, really, just about anything it is that you do, whether you code software or, or whether you edit video, we can probably find a way to help put your skills to work uh, behind this cause. Steve, awesome. um, Thank you. You was, yeah, you, you've been given the moniker of, you know, the, the father of legal cannabis. Uh, right now in the UK, we're, I guess we're at the a kind of critical point. Um, we have been given access to medical cannabis on the NHS, although very few people, I think it's only four um, to date, have actually um, received prescriptions um, for ailments. Like, if there's any advice you could give, or, or you know, um, yeah, how do you think the movement should should work together? Um, is it about people coming together and, and having a unified message, or what's your experience of? Well, I, I think it's a matter of really going into action and seizing the time and understanding that. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Um, you know, many of the prohibitionists like to act like they have claimed the moral high ground here, that there's uh, something wrong with us, that we are less than good people because of our relationship with cannabis. And what we know is that exactly the, the opposite is what's true, that cannabis is an incredibly beneficial substance. It heals our bodies, it heals our spirits and souls, it heals the planet, it provides uh, all sorts of ways to uh, heal people who are ill, to make new products, uh, to grow crops. You know, every hectare of hemp that is harvested sequesters 20 tons of atmospheric carbon uh, from the atmosphere. Um, and, and it's the safest and most natural remedy. So what we know is that our work is actually, is where the, the moral high ground uh, lives. And that the work of spreading this plant around the world to people who need it is a life-saving act. So that's number one. Never forget that you are on the winning side of history. Number two, take matters into your own hands. One of the things that has frustrated me about the European cannabis scene for many, many years is that there's thousands of really great growers in Europe. I've smoked their weed, right? There, there's tons of small gardens. Uh, and there are also hundreds of thousands, millions of people who have severe illnesses like cancer and epilepsy and all sorts of grave, grave illnesses who are suffering and cannabis could end that suffering or at least alleviate it. It's a simple thing. Activists, growers, you grow the weed and then you give it away to people who really need it and they see miraculous transformations in what's going on in their lives. And then those people, people in wheelchairs, mothers with babies in their arms, they become your strongest public advocates. But you can't wait around uh, for the government. You can't just sign petitions. You can't just file court cases. Uh, what we learned is that you have to take action. And when you do, the public will support you. If you end up in a trial and, and you have an opportunity to present the facts about cannabis and have an evidence-based argument about it, you win. We win. Always. Every time. Yeah. Yeah, true. True. We've... Um... Yeah, we, we've got such a postcode lottery still in this country. Um, thankfully, there's there's some people, and we're going to be chatting to one of them later, Carly, um, who, who, yeah, are really pushing, you know, progressive change and working with police people and working with with uh, medical professionals. And, and they seem to be getting, um, yes, yeah, some, some traction, but... Um, but unfortunately, it seems like the apparatus, the the system, the government, what have you, um, really isn't um, interested, or you know that they've 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 legalized or, or um, medical cannabis, but they've they've really allowed it to be, you know, that, that yeah, it's um, it's still not accessible, so it's it's left in the hands of, of police people and, and doctors on the ground to like make difficult decisions, and they don't have the the research often. Um, yeah, well, you have a you have a problem in in, in the UK with the press, um, and you know there there's just been so much negative, ridiculous, hysterical coverage of cannabis in the press. And then you couple that with governments that don't have any interest in changing the status quo. Uh, and and it's, it's difficult, right? Um, and that's why in what we found in California 
we faced exactly the same situation. Our press coverage was mostly negative. The governments in the back in the 1990s had zero interest in, in considering any type of cannabis reform, but people were dying of AIDS. Many, many, many people were dying of AIDS. And so we just started giving cannabis to, to the people who had AIDS and the people who got cannabis lived longer and they had a better quality of life. And it was evident to anybody who looked and saw uh, that you would have a person who was wasting away and dying before cannabis, and then they would start consuming cannabis and they would put weight on. So it was very, very obvious. And, and those stories made their way into the media, not because the media was terribly friendly to cannabis, but because everybody was so terrified of AIDS and looking for, for a way to deal with it. And, and so that's how we cracked through that. We just said, look, we know how to grow weed. We know that it helps people that are sick. We're going to put it into their hands. And then we did something very brave. We came out. We said, not only are we going to break the law by giving these sick people the cannabis that they need, but we're going to invite the news media to come in and cover this story. And that's how we broke the blockade. That's how we started gaining ground. And I think it's those kinds of acts of bravery and courage that every social movement needs. A change never comes easily. We've never made change with, with racial justice. We've never made um, a, a change with the peace movement. We've never made any kind of change the environmental movement uh, until people are willing to stand up uh, and, and, and commit uh, individual acts of bravery and courage. And, and once that happens, once the way is shown, uh, what we found is that the public, su the public supports you hugely, magnificently. Um, nobody wants to see a child with epilepsy who has 150 seizures a day keep on having seizures if it can be stopped. And cannabis stops it. It's obvious. Yes, it's simple. So it seems like we are, we are getting there, right? You know, slowly but surely, one by one, states, countries are moving towards medical and then opening that up and then you know, we've seen canada some certain different states in america actually legalize recreational use so steve you're you're not only a successful activist you're a successful entrepreneur as well one of the things i love about uh the cannabis space um in every single country that i've gone to is the the ecosystem that is there um you've got artisan craft growers you've got glass blowers um people crafting kind of like wooden vaporizers all of these small businesses interacting which is amazing to see you alluded earlier um around Can canada legalizing cannabis that um you know some good growers have, have maybe been left out um of that and it's as it becomes more inevitable that it's going to be legalized you bring in the interests of you know the big businesses people that may not have supported cannabis in the past what's your thoughts and do you have any advice on how we can best kind of preserve those those ecosystems and that and that culture and not get it lost to kind of like the the corporate takeover as legalization does sweep through the world I think that the short answer to that is that people who care about making sure that something other than corporate cannabis exists in the world need to very actively engage in the regulatory process and make sure that the regulations are set up in such a way so that they benefit the cannabis community rather than predatory corporations. And um, what happens is, is when you have legal reform, you have a cannabis community that's been mostly underground or in the gray market. Um, and therefore, we haven't really learned how to do things like marketing and finance and compliance and all of the other mainstream business skills, because if we marketed in the underground, they would follow the marketing to us and arrest us. And if we kept books, much less real sophisticated financing, that would be evidence against us. <laughs> and, right? so, so we enter this new legal market at a disadvantage. We're going up against corporations who have tons of experience with all of this stuff and they're able to more successfully engage with the regulatory process and more successfully raise money than the legacy cannabis community and so the really you know there's there's a few ways to fight it but the starting point is making sure that you have a set of regulations that give you the foundation i'll give you an example um in mexico which is one of two countries that legalized cannabis last week israel was the other one um, uh, they have set aside 40% of all cannabis licenses 
for the indigenous communities that traditionally have been producing the majority of cannabis in Mexico to avoid them being displaced. Now, I don't think 40% is anywhere near enough, right? But that is the kind of mechanism that's going to be needed. Then what we need to do is we need to make sure we have a really educated cannabis tribe globally. Uh, what we can expect from corporations is what corporations do. They care about profit. They don't care about anything else. They will do whatever it takes to make as much money, most of them. There's a few exceptions to the rules, and there's many companies, smaller companies, that are an exception to the rule. So what we need to do is if we want a cannabis industry that reflects the values that the cannabis plant teaches us, if we want a cannabis industry that serves our community, then we need to understand who the companies are that are supporting our community, that are supporting regulations that help us defend our community, and who the companies are who are doing the opposite. And we need to vote with our dollars, and we need to be very conscious about it. We need to know where our cannabis comes, who's growing it, how are those workers treated, is the cannabis being grown in a sustainable way, who owns this company? Uh, how is the wealth that this company is, is generating being shared? Is any of it being shared with the community? Are they doing anything to help get our prisoners out of prison? Those are the kinds of questions that we need to start asking of the cannabis industry. The industry arose out of our movement and out of our community. Ultimately, we are their customers and we have the power to drive resources to or away from companies. And we need to do that. We need to do it in a loud and a visible way. Yeah, totally. It's I amazing think, info, thank you. Yeah, I think it's a, a, a point that goes across all spectrums, right? Not just cannabis, but if you're uh, an environmentalist or, or, or if you have a, a passion about anything, your dollar really, really does speak. You know, you really can, um, yeah, change your habits and, and try and encourage other people to do the same. Um, well, it's, it's incredible, right? Think about the potential we have now, right? I, I just mentioned this figure, 20 tons of atmospheric carbon for every hectare of hemp harvested. There are, the UN says there's 260 million cannabis consumers in the world. We know that there's multiples larger than that, right? We are as large or larger than all but the very largest of nations. What would happen if 50% of us decided that we are going to convert our wardrobes to hemp? Yeah, yeah. How many jobs and companies and businesses would we generate? How many tons of atmospheric carbon would we remove from the planet? We just, just us, just the cannabis people could have a material impact on global warming just by all coordinating our wardrobes, right? Yeah, yeah. So yes, we can have huge impact, huge impact. Yeah, and I guess like the 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 work still got to be done in the states, right? Because still federally, cannabis is illegal. Whether that changes under a Biden administration, you know, I, hopefully it'll be seen. But um, um, yeah, there's I, I think there's an assumption sometimes that in America, um, you guys have cracked it or or, or a, the holy holy grail almost the holy land, but. Um, yeah, there's still a lot of work to be done there. Do you do you, do you hope that, um, especially going back to the last prisoner project, that a, a change in in administration will hopefully, you know, see a move towards you know expunging all these convictions? I think we can expect some progress from the Biden Harris administration, not because Biden or Harris gives a damn about <laughs> us or our prisoners but because um, there is such a powerful movement now, progressive movement in this country that recognizes that one of the main tools of systemic racism has been cannabis prohibition. And, and, and they're not going to have any more of it. They're demanding change. We are demanding change. And so this whole racial component of cannabis prohibition and resistance to cannabis prohibition is very potent and powerful now in the wake of the George Floyd protests. Uh, and uh, Biden and Harris understand that, that the people who were in the streets are an important part of their constituency. So they will make some concessions to us. But we need to remember that Harris is a former prosecutor. Uh, she has put hundreds of cannabis people in prison. She has been responsible for literally hundreds of cannabis prosecutions in the state of California. Um, uh, we supported her nonetheless when she ran for attorney general. 
And a year later, um, when the federal government came to California to close down the industry, Harris supported them rather than supporting us. Right. Biden, he's one of the main architects of mass incarceration. He's been a drug warrior uh, his entire career. So it's not a natural position to the one to that for them. It's it's a position that we are dragging them to. Um, uh, so I, I I think that we will see progress, but it's a testament not to the good character of either the president elect or the vice president elect, but rather to the persistence and determination of our movement. Yeah, I guess that's something to to remember, right? The you know the struggle continues, however far we think we're we're getting. Um, there's still people suffering. There's still people in prison. There's still patients who can't access their medicine without you know going to a street corner. It's 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 a crazy world we live in. Um, yeah, it's um, the film festival was was born out of activism, um, I guess, and and we hope it's a place for people to come together and you know share ideas and um yeah do you um do you think films are uh an important medium to help tell these stories to help re-educate people well stories is how we make up our mind about controversial topics right um, uh, if you, if you like walk up to a crowd of people and there's some kind of excitement going on and, 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 and you're trying to figure it out and you see one of your friends, you go up to your friend and what do you do? You say, Hey, what's the story <laughs> or what's the real story here? Right. Yeah. Um, that's how we human beings understand things is we put them in stories. Uh, we don't understand things really by a bunch of statistics or facts, right? You need to distill them down into a story. The story of cannabis is incredibly compelling. What we know is that is that whenever we can get anybody to really sit down and honestly listen to the real story of cannabis, we win them over. It's happened millions and millions of times. It's why reform is, is progressing all over the world. And what we also know is that the visual communication medium is the main way that people communicate now. It's a combination of sound, it's a combination of video, but people watch screens and they learn stories mainly these days from screens. So if we don't tell the story of cannabis on screens, it's not being told. Totally. Yeah, it's um I, I was kind of like drawn to the fact it was films like Reefer Madness that helped I guess um yeah, persecute the plant in in a lot of people's minds. So it seemed only natural that film could help like re-educate um people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm working on a film project right now. Um, I'm working on a, a TV series uh, project right now. I think that that the whole storytelling tip is going to be really important. You know, another one of the projects that I've put together uh, recently is my new podcast, Radio Free Cannabis, and uh, and what I'm doing there is really highlighting the global nature of our movement now. What I was talking about earlier that we are a global tribe there's hundreds and hundreds of millions of us who knows there may be more than a billion of us worldwide and we've all grown up with stigma or prohibition we've all had the same experiences with the plant we've all learned the same lessons and we've developed a common value system that spans the whole globe so what i do with radio free cannabis is is give a voice to this global cannabis freedom movement with activist correspondents from from all over the world. And uh, and so, you know, we're in this really remarkable point in the cannabis movement. I've been doing this since I was 13 years old. And for most of that time, you could fit everybody important in the movement in one room. We all knew each other, like by first names, right? Yeah. Now, there is so much going on with cannabis so quickly. I mean, Israel and Mexico in the same week last week legalized adult use cannabis. Um, and so, just keeping up with the volume of what's going on is challenging. So it's, it's, it, it, we are really seeing the truth uh, unfolding, right? People love cannabis. We are hardwired for it. Um, uh, soon, not long into the future, the period of time that human beings willingly divorce themselves from the most valuable plant on the planet is going to be recognized for what it is, right? This bizarre aberration in human behavior. Um, for centuries going to the future, our, our descendants are going to be going, really? 
They made cannabis illegal. What were they thinking? Cannabis was illegal and alcohol was legal. What were they thinking? Cannabis was illegal and petroleum was legal. What were they thinking? Right. That's the world we're headed to. Yeah. So, so you've had a, a life, an amazing life uh, in cannabis, and uh, it must be amazing to see a lot of this stuff come to fruition. Is it always going to be cannabis for you, do you think? Um, I know that there's already other things on the horizon, you know, people looking at psilocybin, certain areas around um, these, these other drugs that seem to have therapeutic use. Um, does that side of things interest you or do you think you've got enough on with uh, tackling cannabis full time? Well, cannabis has always been my main focus, but psychedelics has been a part of my path. I, you know, it was probably three weeks after I had that first joint that I took my first LSD trip. <laughs> um, uh, so psychedelics have always been a part of my path personally for strategic and tactical reasons. I did not make that a part of my public messaging until we had cannabis fully legal here in the state of California. But now I have been engaging uh, here, you know, in the city of Oakland, we had a, 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 a voter initiative called Decriminalize Nature that made a variety of visionary plants legal to grow and to consume and to share in the city of Oakland. <clears throat> and I've been uh, involved in that a little bit. Um, the way I look at it is that Cannabis is the kindest and most gentle of Mother Nature's plant teachers, but she has given us literally hundreds of plants that speak to our minds in various different ways. And we've been given these plants for a purpose. And I believe that the purpose is to take us out of what Michael Pollan, great Arthur, um, uh, uh, describes as the default mode network. Um, you can learn more about this in Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, The New Science of Psychedelics. But the default mode network is this place where our, our brain is the most active most of the time. And if you map it out in a brain scan, what you see is that, is that this default mode network, it's about 2 or 3% of your brain. It runs a, around in, in a perimeter around the side of your brain. And each part of the brain is really just talking to, to the part on either side of it in a very linear kind of way. And that's where we're thinking about, am I going to get to work on time? Do I need to shop for this? It's the executive decision-making part of our brains. But there's this other very important part of our brain that's, that's, particularly in the modern world, difficult to access. And that's the meditative, uh, transcendental part of our consciousness. And so when you give a baseline brain uh, that I just described, a psychedelic substance, what you see is a web of interconnections, parts of the brain that never usually talk to each other are chattering away, right? And, and so we're activating uh, this other source of knowledge. And I believe that the reason that it's there is to double check what we're, we're doing with the default mode network. I believe that if we had been using visionary plants for the last 200 years during the industrial revolution, we would not see global warming today. We would not see climate change today because we would have recognized as soon as that started happening, what a stupid thing it was to do. Psychedelics would have taught that to us immediately. But again, you know, um, in, the, in the modern era, um, these, this millennia old tradition of human beings using visionary substances uh, was set uh, swept aside in, 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 in favor of this very authoritarian, profit-driven, uh, mechanico, chemico, petro kind of culture that we've built that we're all miserable in. Yeah. We've kind of like and disconnected not. ourselves from nature. Um, it feels like that anyway. We're forced, well, not forced. We work long hours all weeks, 40-hour weeks to fill our houses with things that we can't afford and rent places that we can't afford. And we even if like we're living in big groups in cities and we're cut the, the lights cut us off from being able to see the stars at night and like you're forced into a position where you don't feel like you can move out of this house that you've filled up with all this money that you've earned with all the possessions that you surround yourself with and you can't and you can't access nature um it's incredible how much cannabis and other like um Oh, yeah give us this ability to kind of like look beyond that and reconnect with things that like should be more important to us as human beings as we like hurtle through space at however many million <laughs> miles an hour on this 
giant rock like it's like what what becomes important to us and that's dangerous to establishments yeah exactly so you know the reason that elites of all kinds have feared visionary plants including cannabis is because these plants give us there's a direct authority right when you have a a, a mystical psychedelic experience you uh, are sent messages that are so profound that are so clear that are so evident to you um, like the messages that psychedelics teach us about nature like the messages that psychedelics teach us about being kind and loving to one another that there's no earthly authority that competes with with that divine authority that we get from the sacred visionary plants and and that's why elites have always uh, feared them um, if you take a look at the development of cannabis prohibition and the prohibition of visionary plants it is contemporaneous with the building of very complex hierarchical societies whose main distinguishing feature is a huge accumulation of wealth and so in most societies today you have a very few number of people who are sitting on top of a pyramid who are taking the majority of the resources that are being created by the majority of people who are all the way below them right and so so the people down at the base are working crazy working hard even people who are kind of high up on the the pyramid are working crazy crazy hard but not having an opportunity to really have a meaningful life right and and meanwhile you have elites that are are you know getting ridiculously rich and wealthy off of this who then use that wealth and that power to deny us access to the medicines that we need to straighten out the mess that they're creating yeah. so um but yeah. look mother nature is going to win this one mother nature is going to win this one if that's not evident to people yet it's going to become more evident in the future she's either going to win because we're going to wise up and we're going to change our ways or she's going to win because she's just going to toss us off like a used yeah. rag and say all right yeah. human beings you guys blew your chance to be here on the planet out with you okay yeah. <laughs> and that's that's the choice that we face now fortunately we have this incredible generation of young people all around the world i call them the smartest generation who are turning back to the plants are turning back to the visionary plants are turning back to, to plant-based diets are beginning to think about plant-based clothing and plant-based construction and all the other things that we need to do to move ourselves away from this really sort of primitive period in human development where we learned how to build things but we did it in a stupid way with petroleum and by cutting down forests and 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 doing things that ended up polluting our oceans and now we're moving into an era where we understand industry we understand how to move things but we have reconnected with the importance of working with mother nature instead of trying to to dominate her and the the young people who are alive today that i see are just filled with a passion uh, for that mission and um I've been waiting for this generation for about 40 years, and I'm so happy they're here. Nice. Wonderful to hear you speak to these things. Yeah. Steve, thanks so much for your time. Um, we're about to watch uh, a film about Dennis Perron, who um, I'm sure you're aware of his work. He was a, an activist in, in San Francisco and a pioneer in the, in the yeah, AIDS um, crisis. Yes. Dennis and I sold a lot of weed well, to and from each other and a few other substances as well he was a very dear friend of mine and um he i'm glad that he's being remembered um because really what he deserves is sainthood um he was just one of the most remarkable selfless giving loving individuals i've ever encountered in my entire life so enjoy that film about dennis he's a remarkable remarkable person thank nice. you thanks and yeah thanks so much for your time and and yeah thanks best of luck with the the projects yeah Yep, yep. You can uh, catch me on there at Radio Free Cannabis on all the usual platforms. Awesome. awesome. Lovely. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. <laughs> and you. Legend. Steve <laughs> D'Angelo, legend. <laughs> <laughs>